10 Minute Murder contains depictions of actual crimes. What you are about to hear is real and violent in nature. Discretion is advised. This is 10 Minute Murder. Welcome to 10 Minute Murder, the brief and bingeable true crime podcast. I'm Joe, the host, and thank you for being here. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. I hope after the episode today, you'll consider subscribing. It will cost you zero dollars to do that, but it will require that you listen to me ramble every now and then about my chubby dog snoring while I'm trying to talk about murder, occasionally make a borderline inappropriate joke, and sit through some commercials that you could totally skip if you wanted to. So just know that going in. And quickly, before we get started today, let me thank those of you that have messaged me and told me that you have listened to every single episode. I don't know how many there are because I stopped counting after about 100. So there are a bunch. And a whole lot of you have smoked this thing right down to the filter. It feels good to know that so many of you are into something that I put a lot of hard work into. Like right now, it's late. I'm going to have a long day tomorrow and I should be in bed. But here I am talking to you about murder knowing full well that it's going to give me nightmares tonight. I really do appreciate each and every single one of you that listen. The murderer in today's story did his killing in Cleveland, Ohio. And several years ago, I was in Cleveland for work stuff for about a week. It's one of those weird cities where I never really felt safe. There were some really cool parts of the city that I enjoyed exploring, and I wanted to catch a Cavaliers game, but they happened to be on the road for the week that I was there. I got my work done, and I still had a good time, but... In certain parts of the city, I was wandering around, and I think I actually said it out loud to someone that was traveling with me. I said, if you're going to get murdered, this would be a convenient place. Then a couple of streets over, it was awesome again, and I had a fantastic lunch. It's a weird city. I don't know, I just never felt really comfortable. Well, Anthony Sewell was a resident of Mount Pleasant, which is a much friendlier-sounding neighborhood in Cleveland than the name suggests. In October 2009, police found the bodies of 11 women at his home. He had raped and killed all of them. This is the story of the Cleveland Strangler. Anthony Sewell, raised in East Cleveland, grew up with an unconventional living situation. Like many future serial killers, his upbringing was filled with abuse and hardship. If you're a parent listening right now and you want to avoid having a serial killer child, it's not guaranteed, but you'd have a better chance at winning the lottery than you would of raising a future monster if you did two things. Show your child love and don't abuse them. Anthony Sewell's mother, who they called Gertrude, had seven children, including him. One of his sisters passed away after battling a chronic illness, and her seven children came to live there with Gertrude. She would beat those seven grandchildren with extension cords until they bled, often while her own children watched. One of the nieces turned 10 years old, and Anthony began raping her on nearly a daily basis for two straight years. No one in the house seemed to care, and she later reported that some other boys in the house raped her too, not just Anthony. So that's how he grew up, basically in constant chaos, children being beaten bloody and family members raping each other. In 1978, at age 19, Anthony joined the Marines. And sometimes when you have a life with no discipline and no structure, and you don't have respect for other people or even yourself, joining the armed forces can be the best decision that you make. They make you have structure. They make you have discipline. They're built on that, and it straightens a lot of people out, shows them that there are other ways to live life. Anthony spent the next seven years in the Corps and earned the Good Conduct Medal with one service star, a Sea Service Deployment Ribbon, a Certificate of Commendation, Meritorious Mast, and two Letters of Appreciation. When he was discharged in 1985, it was honorably. Just a few years later, being back in the same neighborhoods he grew up in, he took the first steps in a new direction. This path would lead to the rape and murder of 11 women. In 1989, a woman three months pregnant, was at Anthony's house. He had told her that her boyfriend was inside waiting for her. When she got inside and saw that her boyfriend was not in there, she tried to leave. Anthony grabbed her, used a belt to tie her hands and feet together, and stuffed a rag in her mouth. He raped her, 
but didn't kill her. She later told police, he choked me real hard because my body started tingling. I thought I was going to die. Anthony Sewell was charged with her kidnap and rape. He pled guilty and spent the next 15 years in prison being a model prisoner. He was released in 2005 and began working at a factory for a couple of years. In 2007, he lost that job because he just stopped showing up and they fired him. He started collecting unemployment checks. He was also supplementing his income by finding scrap metal and selling that. During this time, the neighbors complained of a foul smell on their street. They talked to the health department about it, but they couldn't quite figure out where the smell was coming from. When Anthony Sewell initially went to prison, the internet wasn't really a thing. But when he got out, he discovered the internet and those dark little corners he could hide in and indulge in whatever he wanted to. He created online dating profiles where he said that he was a master looking for submissive women to train. While this was going on, Anthony wasn't exactly a single man. He had a girlfriend, and this girlfriend just happened to be the niece of the Cleveland mayor. I can't imagine that was a good look for his campaign. He had a niece that was dating and living with, for a time, a confessed and convicted rapist. While she lived with Anthony, she complained about the smell. He would always tell her that it was coming from Ray's sausage shop, which was right next door. I'm not spoiling anything because I'm sure you already know that the smell was coming from inside his house, where he was hiding the dead, decaying women that he had been killing right under her nose. She moved out in 2008, and in September 2009, Anthony invited Latundra Billups to his house for a drink. She later told police that after a few of those drinks, he hit her, choked her, and once she passed out, he raped her. For some reason, it took a whole week for police to show up with a warrant to his house. And when they did, he wasn't there. A couple days later, they did find him and take him into custody. But when they initially showed up to his house, they noticed the very strong scent of decomposing bodies. That was enough to warrant a search of his property. Police found the bodies of two women that were buried in a shallow grave in the basement. And four other women were found on the third floor of his home. After digging in the backyard, investigators found three more bodies and partial remains of a fourth. A human skull in a bucket inside his house brought the body count to 11. Most of the victims were killed by manual strangulation, and others were gagged or had ligatures on their bodies when they were discovered. After the investigation, he was also found to have raped three other women, but left them alive. He had lured them to his house, offering to smoke crack cocaine with them. 50-year-old Anthony Sewell was arrested and charged. The trial was supposed to start in June 2010, but was delayed multiple times in order to give his attorneys time to sift through the mountains of evidence they had against him, including surveillance tapes shot from the sausage shop right next door. Finally, halfway through 2011, the trial started. He initially pled not guilty by reason of insanity, but later changed it to just plain not guilty. A little more than a month later, He was found guilty. The jury recommended the death penalty, and the judge agreed. He was placed on death row. Multiple appeals were made, citing, quote, lousy legal representation, unfair media coverage, and having the courtroom closed to the public during an evidentiary hearing and while the jury was being picked. All of that was denied, and he remained on death row. City leaders had the house where the Cleveland Strangler lived, raped, and killed torn down in December 2011. On February 8, 2021, Anthony Sewell died from a terminal illness while receiving end-of-life care at the Franklin Medical Center. That's today's 10-Minute Murder, the brief and bingeable true crime podcast. Now, I need you to know it took a lot of effort to not do this, but earlier this year, when I was doing some research for this case, I kept thinking about the Scranton Strangler and even considered doing an episode on him to release on April Fool's Day. But obviously, I didn't do that. I thought it might be in poor taste alongside the stories of actual murder victims. Plus, I don't really like April Fool's jokes anyway. And if you don't know who the Scranton Strangler is, you have not watched very much of The Office. And by the way, if you have... I fully believe Toby is the real Scranton Strangler. There are a few very good videos on YouTube that connects all the conspiracy dots that kind of proves it. Anyway, thank you for listening today. And if you have a story you'd like for me to possibly cover, 
Not the Scranton Strangler. I'm not doing that. But you can email your actual stories to me. 10minutemurder at gmail.com. 10minutemurder at gmail.com. Use the number 10. Not, you don't write 10. The number 10. You can send those stories to me. If you're not connected with this podcast on social media, you can if you simply click the link in the show notes of this episode or just type 10 Minute Murder into Facebook or Instagram. Before you go, subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening right now and you will never miss another future episode. If you have friends that are into brief true crime stories like this one, tell them about 10 Minute Murder. Thanks for listening. Have a good night.